Now we're back in Daniel tonight. We're back in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel is an exciting book, isn't it? Yeah. So let's bow our heads and our hearts uh, one more time as we get into the word. Lord, Lord, we need the influence, the power, the discernment, uh, the revelation of your Holy Spirit to really truly understand your word. Apart from your enablement, Lord, apart from your aid, we, we can't understand it, Lord. But you said you sent your spirit to be our mentor, our tutor, our teacher, our rabbi, Lord. And so we pray tonight, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Take us places in your word where we haven't been before, Lord. Show us new things, Lord, from your word, Lord. Lord, this is such an exciting time in which we live right now. We are approaching the consummation of all things, all that you have said, so much, so much of what you had focused upon with regard to what you intend to do for your people Israel and for the church, Lord, is about to take place. We thank you for that. And so, Lord, give us that wisdom. Give us insight. Help us to understand the revelation that you have revealed to us, Lord, in your holy name. And everyone said it. Amen. So last time we were together, uh, I think we covered the first 13 verses, but that had been a little while ago. So uh, let me just recap on this first portion of the ninth chapter. Daniel has been a statesman or been in the government administration of Babylon and Persia. Now for how long? Daniel was carried into captivity. Remember, the Babylonian captivity by the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, uh, against Israel was a judgment that God was bringing upon upon his people for turning their back on him. But it began in 605 B.C. in the first captivity or first deportation of the Jews to Babylon, which is present-day Iraq, occurred when? That's right, 605 B.C. That's right, yeah. <laughs> The second deportation of the Jews to uh, Babylon under the uh, leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, right? Happened when? 597. Now, the first deportation, who was carried away in 605? Daniel and his three amigos, right? Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, right? Uh, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the pagan name. God, God wouldn't recognize those. But then in 597, who was carried away in 597? Ezekiel, what a colorful prophet he is, isn't he? Now, Daniel happened to be in the administration of the king. He was in the palace, but Ezekiel was among the refugee camps of God's people, but both used by God to comfort and bring light and revelation, to bring truth, to bring comfort, right? And then the last deportation, uh, which would be the final conquest of Jerusalem, happened when? 586 B.C. So, it tells us here in the first verse of chapter 9, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So, we know exactly when Daniel had wrote this, the chapter 9 was written when, for you scholars? 539 B.C. And the first deportation was when? 605 B.C. So, how long has Daniel been there in Babylon? 66 years. 66 years he's been in exile. Most of his life. He was a young boy, right, Levi? How old are you, Levi? Yeah, he was about your age when he was carried away. So he's been there for 66 years in exile. But he is aware of something that chapter 2 reveals to us. In the first year of his reign, that's Darius, Daniel understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem that the exile would last only 70 years. Now, go with me to Jeremiah for a moment. We'll see that. Jeremiah 25. And this Babylonian captivity of Israel begins what period? Times. Times of the Gentiles, that's right. And when did it end? It hasn't. It has, it'll end with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the times of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles controlling that landmass, which we call Palestine today, that God had given to his people, rightfully. But here in Jeremiah 25, verse 
11, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Verse 12, then it will come to pass when the 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord, I will make it a perpetual desolation. So God was using as he did for the northern kingdom of Israel. The capital was Samaria. Remember, we had a divided kingdom after Solomon's death. So Israel was a divided kingdom. In the north, it was called Israel. Capital was Samaria. In the south, it was called Judea. The capital was Jerusalem, right? Now, the northern kingdom was conquered over by whom? The Assyrians. The Assyrians. In 721 B.C., the Assyrians came over and conquered over the northern kingdom and carried the, the northern kingdom into captivity. Uh, but they should have, the southern kingdom of Judah should have certainly learned the lesson. Wouldn't you have thought? But they didn't. And what was the chief abomination that the Israelites, that the Jews were committing that was such an offense to God? Child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. At the Valley of Tophet. Offering their children to the God Molech. Horrible. Horrible. Is that any different than what is happening today? How many million of lives been extinguished when, when God created the womb of a woman to be the safest place for mankind for the first nine months of their existence in their mother yet today it's one of the most dangerous places to be because 50% of the children can see they're aborted how that must grieve the heart of God because he tells us in his word that the greatest gift that he offers us what is it Levi? The greatest gift he gives his people. <coughs> Treasures like you. Yeah, like Elena back there. And Arden, children. Children are a reward from the Lord. Children are a blessing from the Lord. It's a reward from the Lord to his people. Hmm. Unfortunately, I think God is going to judge America for the same sin, that same abomination. What is it we learn from history? Nothing. Nothing. History repeats itself. We learn nothing from history, do we? No. Now, Daniel is astute in the scriptures that he does have. He has some of the prophets. He has the Torah, right? The Tanakh, right? Uh, he has the five books of Moses. He has some of the prophetic books. He has some of the wisdom literature of the scriptures. And, and so he's a good student of the Bible. And he understands that through the prophet Jeremiah, God had foretold that we're about to approach a time of great change, a blessing for God's people that he's going to redeem, that he's going to restore them back to the land. And so Daniel's very excited about this. He's looking into this. Are you looking into the time in which we live right now? If you're, if you're really looking into the prophetic literature of the Bible, the, what we call the apocalyptic literature of the scriptures, eschatology, right? Uh, study of end times. If you really are a good student of these things, you should be very, very excited about the time in which we live. God is about to make profound change on behalf of his people, Israel, and the church. You understand that, do you? I hope you do. Now, unfortunately, most of Christian dumb, with the emphasis on the dumb, most of Christian dumb have their head in the sand and don't know any of these things, unfortunately. But, but you do, don't you? Because you're, you're good Bereans, you're good students of the word. And so, like Daniel, we should be very excited about the time in which we live. Well, he goes on to say, in verse 3, then I, Daniel, set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord God, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant with, with, keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who do what? Oh, so obedience is aligned with your love for God, Right? Your, your submission is what honors God. If I am your father, he would say in Malachi, where is my honor? He was talking to the nation of Israel that didn't honor him in their obedience to his word and his commands. If I'm your father, where's my honor? 
Why is it you dishonor me by not obeying me? But here, Daniel is referring to the fact that, that God is merciful and he gives mercy and grace to those who love him and keep his commandments. And there was a remnant in Babylon. Now, uh, how long have they been in Babylon? 66 years. What was Babylon likened to? If we were not, not to speak of Babylon literally, but figuratively, what did Babylon represent? The world. That's right, my dear, the world. So Babylon represents the world. And this is an opportunity for God's people to come out from the world. Jeremiah had been crying out to Israel repeatedly in his prophetic ministry to return to the Lord, you know. And God says over and over again, return unto me, return unto me. I think of that song with Dean Martin, return unto me, you know, return to me. <laughs> but nonetheless, they, they wouldn't return. Here, the door is open now for a return unto the Lord. What do we call that when the Jews turn back to the Lord? Teshuvah. They make a teshuvah, where they're turning back to the Lord in repentance, turning back to the Lord in obedience, turning back to the Lord with all their heart and all their life. I've been emphasizing that very much during this season of Advent. We got two candles lit. What do they represent? Hope, Hope peace. and peace. This Sunday we'll let, light the pink candle. What does that represent? Joy, joy. But during this season of Advent, I've been encouraging you to draw closer to the Lord in your communion with the Lord, in your private time with the Lord, because God wants you to experience the private ministry of Jesus in your life individually. Nothing more important. Doesn't matter what's happening out there anymore. Doesn't matter what's happening with anybody else. What, what, what should be paramount in your life is your relationship with the Lord. How close are you drawing to him? Is, is, is this season becoming so fresh, new, and alive to you? I, I tell you, we're having, we're having a very good time with this, aren't we? Yeah, as we're working through those latter chapters of John's Gospel, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, nothing is more private, more intimate, more tender, more revealing than Jesus' ministry at this time with his disciples, the apostles. What, what are they celebrating? Passover. This is the last Passover Jesus will celebrate with his, with his own, with those whom he loves. He is the Passover, is he? The, the Pesach, the Peshkal. In the, Hebrew, in the Greek text, he's, he's the sacrifice that will be made for the sins of the world, for your sins and for mine. Chapter 12 of John's gospel ended what? The public ministry of Jesus to Israel, because Israel rejected Jesus. And so Jesus' public ministry to Israel has ended now, and now the private ministry of Jesus to his own to prepare them for the days that are coming. And it would be difficult days. Wouldn't it be certainly difficult for Israel and for those who are in unbelief, but it would be even difficult for his apostles during that time, wasn't it? And, and I said, to some degree, we could look at the United States today and see how far we have removed ourselves from the honoring and worshiping and submitting to God. We were one nation. Are we now? No, no. Farthest thing from it. And I would like to suggest to you that my observation from the facts and what is taking place in our nation today indicates that the public ministry of Jesus is no longer what it was in the United States of America, but the private ministry of Jesus to the body of Christ. Oh, it's glorious. It's wonderful. Why? Because, listen, he's preparing his body for the days that lie ahead. You don't prepare when you're in the midst of the storm. It's too late. But you have to prepare before the storm comes. And that's precisely what he's doing, beloved. Do you sense that? Do you sense there's a storm on the horizon? I mean, every conceivable measurement uh, aspect of life today that we look at, it, it, it's, it's very concerning, isn't it? But not for us who believe. The Lord is my salvation and my strength. Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the light of my life. To whom should I be fair, scared or anxious or fearful, right? Yeah. Well, Daniel recognized this, but he, he also identifies with the sin of his people and he's making confession. So in the first portion of his prayer here from verses 13 to 14, he's making confession. And then in chapter uh, 9, verses 15 through 19, he's making a petition, a request unto God. That's precisely what he said. Paul would write later on in, in Philippians 4, he said, be anxious for 
Nothing. What does that mean, be anxious for nothing? It means, let no, listen to me, let nothing steal your peace. Now, that was our emphasis last week, right? The theme was peace. Shalom, right? Peace with God by your surrender. Peace of God when the Holy Spirit will enter into you. And then peace in God as the Holy Spirit comes epi upon you for the work of ministry, whatever ministry he has. Now, listen, make no mistake. Every one of us are called to be in the ministry. Every saved soul is to minister. Is that not true? Yeah, yeah of course. And what is your ministry? And have you entered into that ministry that God has for you under his power, under the influence of his spirit? So important, so important. Yeah. <clears throat> so he's praying, and as Paul said in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests and your supplications be known unto God. And, and the God of peace, well, what? Guard your heart and minds. The God of Shalom, the God of peace. He'll let nothing steal your peace. And that word guard is a military term there in Philippians 4, where he says he sets a guard over your mind and your heart and your life so that nothing can steal that peace. And that peace is, is from inward, not outward. It doesn't depend upon our circumstance, right? You can't wait. I, I heard, a, I heard a, a, anybody ever watch uh, America's Got Talent? No. I watch this one thing. Well, I, it's like I'm, I'm, I love uh, vocalists, singers, you know. Any, anybody ever see the girl, Nightbird? She's a Christian, but she has cancer. She's a terminal cancer. Nightbird. Do you remember the comment she made? I'll never forget it. Do you remember the comment she made when she was explaining that the cancer was all over her body? She said, you can't wait until life is the way you want it to be happy. You can't wait until your life is trouble-free. Happiness is, is a state of being. It's intentional. It's, it's all dependent upon your relationship with the Lord, not your outer circumstance, not the situation you're under, right? Because that peace that he's talking about can be given to you no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation. Isn't that true? And it's, many of us have experienced that in the difficulties that we go through in this life. And so the difficulties are our opportunity to demonstrate the glory of God and the peace and the joy that he does give. Amen? Yeah. So Daniel, Daniel is praying now. He's making his uh, confession known. He's verse 5. Now, did you notice that the first song that uh, David and, and Terry led us in was titled? What was it titled? You didn't notice. Okay. Daniel 9. The title of the song was Daniel 9. And so it was Daniel's prayer of confession. He was identifying with the sins. Should we not identify with the sins of this nation? How many of you grew up watching the wonderful world of Disney? You know, I'm dating myself. I mean, you know, but I loved it. You know, Bonanza, right, was on in the wonderful world of Disney, you know. Huh? And who was the little bug that would come out on the end? The little insect? What? Jimmy the Cricket, right? And, and what would he say at the end of every episode, every, every season, every uh, program? Let your, let your conscience be your guide. Now, listen, that was in, in the 50s and the 60s in the United States of America. You could say that because we had a common conscience. The conscience of America was formed by the Judeo-Christian belief or philosophy of life. Judeo-Old Testament, Christian New Testament. And, and so when you told people, let your conscience be your guide, that was a very safe thing. You could say that. And, and most people had a common understanding of what was right and what was wrong, of the meaning of life and who God was. Is that not true? Now today, today if you tell most people, especially young people, let your conscience be your guide. Ay, 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 ay. You can't do that, can you? No. So case in point on, on how we have as a nation turned our back. on God. We're so far removed from where we were. You watch those old programs, you know, Father Knows Best, Ozzy and Harry. You know, just, they were so sweet and so wholesome and so, uh, so many good life living lessons, so moral. And today... It's a, I, you can't, I can't watch television. It's a cesspool. You know. Yeah. But we still have to identify with the sins that are taking place in our nation. Because but for the grace of God, what? We would all be there. You would. Make no mistake about that. 
For we have sinned, committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Yeah, there's a lot of people who say they believe in God, but they don't obey him. I tell you all the time, beloved, listen with your, listen with your eyes, not your ears. That will reveal everything to you. And he's saying, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, to our fathers, to all of the people of the land, to the young and to the old, to the poor and to the rich, to the weak and to the strong, to the servant and the king. Everyone, everyone has turned their back on God. Jesus would say in his day to the Pharisees and the Sadducees of religion, which, which of the prophets have you not? They did. Every one of the servants that God sent to his people, they either persecuted, mocked, imprisoned, or killed. And then finally he said, no, I'll, I'll send my own dear son. Surely they will believe him. And what happened? The same. Attempted to commit deicide. Can you kill God? No, it's crazy. We're, today we're trying to do the same thing. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all of Israel, those near and those far off and all of the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, to our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Now, now, Daniel is going to lean upon God's chief attribute, and the chief attribute of our God is love. love. He is the way. The way is the way of agape, right? Love. And so Daniel is going to lean on that love, on the mercy that we call the loving kindness of God. What's that Hebrew word? Hesed. Hesed. And what does that mean? Loving kindness, it, it really speaks of a fatherly love, a, com- a father who has committed himself to the love of his, his bride, his wife, and his children. It's, it's a provisional love. It's, it's a love that provides. It's a love that provides, of a love that protects, and it's a love that guides. It's, it's love in all of its fullness, the hased of God, as his mercy and his patience. As it, you know, it takes a lot to be patient in growing teenagers, doesn't it? You're getting there, Anthony. You'll see. (laughs) It takes a lot of patience, a lot of mercy, right? A lot of understanding to grow teenagers today. Hmm? Yeah. (laughs) That's nice. Grandchildren are your reward for not killing your teenagers. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Oh, Lord, to us belongs shame of face. Yes. But, Lord, we lean upon your mercy, your forgiveness, though we have rebelled against you. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, verse 10, now to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so that they have not obeyed your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. What's curse? What is this he's talking about here? Deuteronomy, that's right, chapter 28. It's the, the Deuteronomistic literature or Deuteronomistic law that, that all of them embraced at that time was if you were obedient to God, then you were? And if you were disobedient to God, you were? Right. But is that always the case? No. No. The, the, do difficult things happen to good godly people? Yes. Of course they do. Yes. And, and you know, God is, uh, Jesus is, we we'll call him the great physician, right? And the great physician knows exactly what we are in need of, doesn't he? And some of the things that he prescribes for our life are very difficult. But yet it's the very thing we need to help perfect us, to mature us, to grow us. As I've said so often before, is he looking, is he looking for a perfection of performance, Levi? No? What's he looking for? Perfection of what? Grasshopper? Relationship. He's just saying, just, just love me. Peter... Before the rooster crows, you will what? Betray me, Betray me three times. But, but Jesus knew Peter's heart, and, but he knew Peter's weakness. But at the end of John's gospel, he restores Peter by allowing him to confess his love to him three times. Yeah. Aren't we, aren't we thankful? How many times have we denied him? 
our thoughts, our actions, our desires. How many times? Oh, more than three. That's right, Levi, more than three. Oh, but, but he loves us so, doesn't he? Yeah. And he forgives us. Mm. And he, verse 12, has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges, who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such never has been done as was been done to Jerusalem. Now, it is amazing, isn't it, that God would use such a despicable people like the Assyrians to judge the northern kingdom. The Assyrians were so cruel. No one would want to be captured by the Assyrians. Better you commit suicide than you become a captive or a slave to the Assyrians. The Babylonians were a different matter now. The Babylonians wanted to assimilate you into their culture. They wanted you to join them. Let's hold hands, get a Coke, and sing. We're the world. So consequently, when Darius, Cyrus actually, released the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to return unto the Lord and to rebuild the city and the temple and the worship of their God, how many went back? Not many. many. Less than 50, 49,000, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but I know it's just just under 50,000. That was a fraction, a fraction of the Jews that were in Babylon. Why was it just a fraction that went back? Life was good good in the world. They were enjoying the world. They were enjoying Babylon. They didn't want to come out from Babylon. Babylon. And unfortunately, that's the case with too many people who profess to be Christian. Their, their appetites, their desires, their behaviors, their conduct, they're more like the world than it is the church, isn't it? Yeah. Make no mistake, it's always been just a remnant, just a remnant, you know. And consider the ministry of Jesus Sunday we learned that he promised us that when he would send the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, we would do greater works than he did. And what were those greater works? Sharing the gospel. gospel. That that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, would would use his his children, his disciples, his followers, to, to share the gospel so that there would be a greater fruitfulness in their sharing than he had. Jesus had very few true converts during his earthly ministry, didn't he? Peter had how many at his first sermon? 3,000. Wow. That was when? On what day? Pentecost. Pentecost. Isn't that interesting? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. When Moses was leading the children of Israel and they had the giving of the law to the people of Israel, what happened that day? 3,000 died. Isn't that interesting? For the law brings forth, but the spirit brings forth 3,000 died with the giving of the law. 3,000 came to life with the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Far greater than the ministry of Jesus, right? It was never more than a remnant with Jesus. So Jesus would speak to the multitudes, and then we saw that he sent out the 70, remember? 35 evangelistic teams, two by two. And then he reduced the, the, the 70 to how many? The 12. The 12. And he reduced the 12 to the inner circle of... And he reduced the three to, and who was the one? John the Beloved. And what was unique about John compared to all of the other apostles? He was never martyred. And there was a reason for that. His obedience, his devotion, his faith in God that God had given him was proven genuine when he risked his life at the cross. He was at the cross with the women. Where were the other ten? They ran for their lives, right? But their faith had to be proven genuine in martyrdom. Interesting, isn't it? You know, I, I, I believe that no one, no true Christian leaves here without God proving to them, one way or another, he has given them saving faith. Do you have a preference on the way in which that would be shown? Yeah, I do. I, I prefer that my faith would be shown genuine by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life through obedience. Right? Through being willing to serve him and follow him no matter what the cost. Not preserving my life here at all costs. Right? But one way or another, everyone who is a true believer will have that faith proven genuine by the Lord. Not, be, not the Lord. He, he knows already. Right? But he's proving it to who? Yes. To you. To you. Are, you. are you thankful for God's saving grace? Isn't that wonderful? 
But what is even more wonderful? Keeping. His keeping grace. I, I don't keep myself. We can't. Grasshopper, you've got to continually keep your life in his hands. And he'll keep you. Because as you grow older, now don't put, put the Bible, as you grow older, the temptations will become greater. And the only way you can resist them is staying in his hands. Amen? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Verse 13 says, it is this day, the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Oh, we're so hard-headed, aren't we? Hard-headed, hard-hearted. I mean, how difficult does it need to be for you to turn to him? Only God can put it in your heart to turn to him. Otherwise, we get stiff-necked, we dig in our heels, and I'm not doing it. He said yes, I say no. He said no, I say yes. Right? Is that not true? Yeah. 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 And that's, that's what Israel was doing. Hmm. Crazy. <sighs> Therefore, the Lord has kept this disaster in mind and brought it upon us. Verse 14. For the Lord, our God, is righteous in all of his works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. <laughs> when God judges you, all I'll have to say is righteous are you, Lord. Right. Who said that? Charles Spurgeon's mother before he was saved. Charles, when God judges you, if I'm there, all I'm going to be able to say is righteous, Lord, righteous. Oh, oh, oh. Those are pretty tough words from a mama. <laughs> well, that's basically what he's saying here. Yeah. And now, O oh Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Sins, what is that? Missing the mark. Transgressions, what is that? Willfully. Willfully crossing the line. Iniquities? Iniquities are your dirty, rebellious, twisted, wicked little heart. That's our iniquities. Only God can change that, right? Sins, we miss the mark. Transgressions, we purposely go over the line. Iniquities, that's what I am. I am wicked. O oh Lord, verse 16, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away. So now there, first there's confession, now there's this petition, Lord, please, Lord, restore us. Turn back to us, Lord. For your fury may be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all who are around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayers of your servant and the supplications, and, the, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city, which is called by your name, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds. No, but because of your great mercies. What is that wonderful verse in Lamentations? You like Lamentations? Chapter 3 through verse 22, chapter 3, 22 through 25. You should memorize this. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassions, they fail not. Mm, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Aren't we glad his mercy is new every morning? Chapter verse again, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, chapter 3, Lamentations, 22 to 25. Why are they new every morning? Because you need it. You used up everything yesterday, didn't you? You used up all that mercy yesterday. So now you need new mercy. So you not only need a new quantity, you need a new kind. Because we sin in so many different ways, right? We rebel, we transgress. But thank God for his mercies each and every morning. Your, he's in, and that's how Daniel is petitioning. And always when you pray to God, pray to God, petitioning him to display the glory of his compassionate, loving, merciful, forgiving nature. His long, so you, don't you hate to couple those two words together, long and suffering? 
you know, I don't, I don't like suffering, and I don't like, surely don't like suffering long, but God suffers long with whom? Me. Me. Just like my wife, you know, she suffers long with me. Verse 19, O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and for your people who are called by your name, for your reputation, Lord, for your glory, for your honor, Lord. Lord, you promised through Jeremiah that this captivity will only be 70. You promised, Lord, that something wonderful is about to take place. There's a change where you're bringing your people back to you, back to the land that you promised us, back to the place of true worship. Boy, do we not need that today? I mean, really? For God's people to get back to the place of true worship? What's, what's, what's true worship? Is it singing songs? No. Is it doing your devo? No. What is true worship? Living a devotional life of love. Obeying God when everything within you doesn't want to. What is that Greek word for worship? Proskunuos. What does it mean? To turn towards and kiss. It's the same thing my dog does to me every morning when he says good morning to me. What does he do? He comes over, he licks my hand. You know why? He wants toast. We could live on tea and toast, me and Snickers, you know. <laughs> but, but every morning, isn't that true? Every morning he comes over, morning, Daddy, morning, Daddy. You got something good for me? <laughs> that's what that word means. It's the same word that's used when a dog licks his master's hand or when you kiss someone in devotion, in love, to turn towards and to kiss. That's worship. Now, how do we kiss the Lord with our life? By showing our love. And we don't feel compulsion. I don't have to obey. I don't feel forced to obey. I don't feel obligated to obey. I want to obey. Mm-hmm. It's, it's exercising the choice to love in obedience, right? Yeah. School taxes. You like paying school taxes? I use this example. Do you, you like paying school taxes? Why should I pay for somebody else's kid's education? You know, I just use that as an example. But I don't know how much money I've spent on my son's education. And not once have I ever wrote those checks begrudgingly, but gladly, joyously, thankfully. You know, you carry yourself responsibly. You get the results that... You know, your best efforts will never be a D or an F, will they? Will they? No. You may not have an aptitude for a certain subject, but if you give it your best effort, it'll never be a D or F, will it, Levi? And and most often, it'll be a B or an A, won't it? Yeah. So you get that desired result, and and you gladly write those, those checks to fund that education, right? That's the difference. Why? Because you're doing it in love. For love's sake. That's the same thing I've got. All right. Now, God is going to send the answer through the person of the angel, Gabriel, right? How many archangels are there? I think there's three. Uh, Who are they? Gabriel, Michael, Lucifer, right? Now, each one was created to minister to whom? A person of the Godhead. The Godhead is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? And, and we know that each one of them are in charge of a third of the angelic community, correct? Satan, Hasatan, or Lucifer, right? He led a third of the stars of heaven cast to the earth. And we call them not angels any longer. What do we call them? Demons. demons. Is there not demon activity on the earth? Yeah. Do you not see the influence of demons in our society today? The crime rate? I mean, just the senseless violence? Michael, what, what is Michael known for? The archangel Michael. This is important that you know. Angelology is an important thing. Now, are there any female angels? No. no make no mistake about that. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the female gender. I love women. I love my sister. I love my mother. I love my wife. I love my wife in heaven. I love my wife on earth. You know? I love my sisters. <laughs> but there are no female angels, are there? They're all in the male gender. There's a reason for that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. So Michael, Michael, what is he known for? Warrior. 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 Now, he represents El Shaddai. Who's that? God the Father. 
God the Father. Michael represents God the Father. He was ministering on behalf of God the Father. When, when Satan has to be bound, when, when you know, business has to be taken care of, who does God send? Michael. Michael. He's the guy. Hmm. Gabriel. Every time we read about Gabriel, the archangel, what is he doing? He's a messenger. He's giving messages. He gave the message here to Daniel. He's the one who gave the message to Zechariah. He's the one who gave the message to Mary, to Joseph, right? He's the messenger angel. And so what person of the Godhead would he be representing, created to represent and minister on behalf of? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the messenger, right? And then the shining star, the day star, the morning star, Lucifer, who was he meant to create, created to minister on behalf of? Jesus. Jesus. Isn't that interesting? But he wanted the glory to himself because he was the most gifted of all the angelic creation. And pride filled his heart, his life. And so he rebelled. Hmm. And a third of the angels went with him. But aren't we glad there's a two to one odds? Good angels versus, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is Gabriel, the messenger angel, the one who ministers on behalf of the Holy Spirit to God's people. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mount, from the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, it wasn't a man, it was Gabriel, right, an angel, just as you remember, Luke describes two men in white. They weren't men, were they, by the tomb? What were they? Angels, angels. So sometimes the writer will, will call the angel a man when it's really an angel. Whom I had seen in the vision in the beginning being caused to fly swiftly. Men don't fly, do they? Angels fly. Reach me about the time of the evening offering. Now, Daniel was known to pray how many times a day? There are three. So this is, this is one. Listen, I'm hoping that God soon will come to me in one of my customary prayer times. And I would prefer him rather than the angel. But if he brings an angel, that's okay too. I haven't seen one. Anybody see angels yet? Anybody here? No. As we move further on into this extraordinary time in which we live, don't be surprised at some of the supernatural occurrences that may take place when you're living a devotional life to God. how God will communicate with you in some extraordinary ways. As he did in the past. He's the same yesterday, today. Yeah, yeah. So I'm expecting that, you know, and it's, it's okay. But I'm, I'm so appreciative of how he speaks to me every day in his word. Hmm? And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have come now forth to give you understanding skill to understand, to, to really be able to understand the revelation that God has given. And we need help, don't we? We need, we need divine enablement to, to understand the Bible, don't you? Do you remember what it was like before you were saved, before you had the Holy Spirit's tutelage when you read the Bible? I remember. Man, it was like eating sawdust. You know, I mean, my first wife was saved. She returned unto the Lord. She was devoting herself to the Lord. I was not a saved man. And, and she and others were encouraging me to read. I, I, ancient words meant nothing, nothing. Dead. I was dead to the word. But when the spirit quickened me, everything changed. Wow. I, listen, I, I cannot read the Bible without it speaking to me. Oh, how many times have I told you? We don't read the Bible. The Bible reads me. The Bible reads me. And so Daniel, oh, what a, what a wonderful man. This was his evening devotional, and now the angel comes to him and tells him, I've come to give you great skill in understanding the revelations of our God. And unfortunately today, what do we call that today? What's that D word? When you're reading the revelations of God and you really comprehend it, you understand it. What do we call that? Discernment discernment. Do you know that's the number one need in the, in the professing church today? Yes. Do you know how undiscerning the majority of the people are? Look at the crazies that they follow. I mean, I, I, I think to myself, how can reasonable thinking people believe in God, believe in his word, follow these charlatans, these hucksters? Do you know how many people claim to be Christ today? Have you ever looked at that, any of this stuff? People all over the world claiming to be Christ and they have thousands of people following them. It's very clear who Christ is and who he ain't. <laughs> it's crazy. 
At the beginning of your supplications, verse 23, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, first of all, first of all, you are... Oh, wow. Levi, God is crazy about you. Did you know that? You don't know that? The word so loudly speaks of his love for all of us. You know, I I remember the first time I read this, I thought, I wish God knew. Don't you wish an angel would come down, sit on the end of your bed and say, hey, hey, Gail, you are greatly beloved of God. Would that be wonderful? Well, he has, hasn't he? And how has he done that? Through his word. Ephesians tells me that we are the beloved of God, greatly loved. As a matter of fact, you understand, I have more understanding in the revelation of Daniel than Daniel did. Wow. Why? Because I'm no longer a servant, but he calls me friend. He loves me. Whom he loves, he reveals his truth to. And so I am just so thankful I can understand these 12 chapters that Daniel wrote far better than Daniel did at the time. Daniel didn't understand what he wrote. You understand that? Good. And he wants to give wisdom and understanding to those whom he loves. And so he said, first of all, I just want you to know you're, how do you know you're greatly beloved of God? Because God has revealed himself to you. He's man, remember Jesus said that, that, that if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll obey the words that I have given you because they come from my father and my father will love you and we will manifest ourselves to you, reveal ourselves. How does God reveal himself? Through his word. When I was lost, psh, when I got saved, God has not stopped revealing himself to me through the word, manifesting himself, manifesting himself and through other believers, right? Isn't that wonderful the way he does that? Greatly beloved, therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So now he's going to give him all this understanding into what he wrote. He's going to unlock the secret of Bible prophecy. He's going to unlock the plan of God from the beginning of creation to the end, all in the way in which God is dealing with his people, Israel. And next week, next week, it's 8 o'clock, next Next week, we'll get further into the text. But as we get into the rest of chapter 9, this is the 77s of Daniel. We measure everything in tens, don't we? Ten years is what? A decade. The Jews don't measure things in tens. What do they measure them in? Sevens. They measure them in sevens. Seven years, a heptad. So what Daniel is describing is how God is working with all of human history in the way in which he deals with the nation of Israel, his people, that there are 77-year periods of history where God is dealing directly with the Jewish people from this point until the end of the age, the consummation of the age. Now, there will be a break. We have seen the first 69 sevens. 69 sevens is what? 480 years. And how many days in their calendar? 360 times 480 years? Yeah, 1, 173,880 days. Already completed. 173,880 days have been completed. Daniel has been the prophet with the privilege of giving the exact day in which Christ came the first time and the, not the rapture, I'm talking about the second coming. The second coming of Jesus is really in two phases, right? The first time he comes for the church, second time he comes with the church, right? First time, we meet him in the air. He doesn't come to planet Earth. The second time, we touch down with him at planet Earth. That's the second coming. Daniel has prophesied the very first coming of Jesus, declaring himself to be the Messiah of Israel, right? The Mashiach Nagid. And the second coming, where he comes to redeem and restore Israel to the very day. You remember last time we were together, we went through that calculation where the Bible reveals to us the exact day in which the judgment of Israel would be over. And, and what day did we come to? We came to May 1948. And what happened May 1948? Israel no longer dispersed among the nations of the world. The diaspora ended, and now they have their own homeland. 
and the Aliyah, the gathering together of God's people back into the land. Fascinating. And the, it was amazing, wasn't it? When we went through that calculation. Well, next week, next week we're going to go through this. It's fascinating. These 70 heptads, 69 heptads have occurred. The last seven-year period has not yet occurred. What do we call that last seven-year period? Tribulation. The tribulation. Now, the tribulation is really the last three and a half years. The first three and a half years, oh, it's all in disguise, isn't it? Yeah. It's all fake news. <laughs> Questions, comments? Hey, if, if you haven't signed up to join us on our little bus excursion to the library, uh, make sure you do so. See Pastor Darren. Get your name on the list. We're going to have a great time. And you're going to be amazed. Uh, once again, all God is looking for is availability. He's just looking for you to surrender your life. Uh, you know, God spoke through a donkey, right? And, you know, he's still doing that today. You got one sitting up here talking to you now, you know? But it's just, it's just, I mean, no, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm just amazed that God would even, just the revelation he gives me, just the understanding he gives me. Why, Lord? I don't know. But I, I just, I know that every day, what, my responsibility is to just yield to him. You're responsible, just make your, it is required of a steward to be found faithful. Just be, just, just be faithful to what God has called you to do, whatever that might be. God will determine the platform. But it's all God, you see? So small or great, same reward. Why? Because you've simply made yourself available. You've been faithful. And God will equip the call. God will minister powerfully through those who make themselves available. Don't get caught up in Babylon. There's enough Babylon in this particular season of the year, isn't there? Don't get caught up in that. Stay focused on the true meaning of the season and what your life is here for. Anybody see the latest uh, little uh, clip of Franklin Graham since he had his open heart surgery? He's lost weight. I that. He did lose weight, didn't he? You know, before he was a little mushy on his presentation, he, he faced a uh, near-death experience. And his latest little clip is very, very direct. Very bold, very intentional. Why? You know, listen, listen, every one of us need to consider what's my purpose? What, what have I done, really, truly? Why am I here? You know, how much time we have spent on things that don't matter at all? Effort, money, time, our you know, we're going to give account for how we have spent our life. What did you exhaust your life on? Your resources, your time, your whatever. Where's your heart, your devotion? Let it be the, hey, let there be a change this season. Let's teshuva. Let's agree, all of us, we'll, we'll teshuva. We'll return back unto the Lord like never before. Come out from among them, my people, he says through Paul, and as he's writing to the Corinthian church. And much of the church today is like the Corinthian church. Come out from among them. And I will be your God. And you will be my people. Let's display to the world. There's something very different about us. And that difference being Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Terry, you got a closing song? Shall we stand?